Facebook page and YouTube channel. We are excited to have another virtual author event for you this evening. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn Booksellers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, tonight, we have two Minnesota authors talking to you uh, about their novels. John Rosengren will be talking about his novel, A Clean Heart, and Paul John Scott will be talking about his novel, Malthorist. Um, and first, they're going to have a little discussion uh, between the two of them about John's novel, A Clean Heart. So we're very pleased to have both of these authors here with us tonight. Um, I want to remind you that both books are available at majorsandquinn.com. If you want to head over there, I will drop links into the comments underneath this video. And while you're looking at the comments, you can also ask questions. So, you know, type in the comments, let us know where you're watching from, um, and ask any, sorry, that's my cat, uh, <laughs> ask any questions that you want. Hey, come here. Ugh. Ask some questions of these two authors. Um, they will be answering questions at the end of their discussion and their readings, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. So once again, thank you both for being here, John and Paul, and thank you everyone who's watching, and I will be back for your questions. Bye. Well, you're welcome. Thanks, Thanks oh. <clears throat> Hey, John. She disappeared. We go back a little bit, don't we? Yeah. John and I are both well. magazine writers. Yeah, we are both magazine writers uh, who have published novels. Um, and so it's really cool that we get to do this together because I feel like we're coming at this both with sort of a, a similar sense of wonder. Although you actually have um, uh, training in uh, English literature. And so you are more of a, a slick package than I am. But this is a great book. And I wanted to ask you, uh, just uh, just to kick it off, how did this come about, John? What uh, what led you to write the A Clean Heart? Well, uh, it started back when I was smoking dope uh, in high school, and I got busted, and I wound up in detox and then treatment, and then uh, wound up working in a treatment center myself, got fired, and uh, <clears throat> then I decided I wanted to well, I was writing fiction, but I thought, oh, this might be a good book. <clears throat> so, I mean, the treatment center I worked at was this this nutty place. I mean, there was all sorts of backstabbing and gossip and uh, suspicion among the staff. And it was just, it, it was crazy, dysfunctional place. I ended up, actually, I got fired. So maybe it was a testament to my sanity that uh, I got fired because I couldn't fit into the system. Um, so anyway, I, I use that as the backdrop, and, and uh, several of the characters are drawn directly from people I knew there at uh, the treatment center. I won't say which ones. Uh, but then uh, as I started writing, um, you know, the characters took on a life of their own, and the story took off and, and uh, it moved from the realm of uh, the you know, memory and reality to fiction and, and uh, make-believe, and I hope... Uh, uh, story that that you know took uh, people got interested in, um, <clears throat> but I guess that's the basis of how I got started on it. So it's a sneaky book because it's very uh, it seems very sneaky. light. I found, and then it it sneaks up on you, and I really got hit with a a wallop at the end, and uh, that's yeah. to your credit. But I just I just wanted to ask you what you think. Um, uh, literature can say about recovery you know i don't I imagine you've read a few novels that are set in the recovery community and what's your what's your take on those and what did you want to do different well uh probably the the standard is one flew over the cuckoo's nest and um you know i don't think i could outdo ken kesey but certainly if i could get some humor in there like he had and some believable characters uh that you know that, that I'd, I'd be happy with that um but you know as far as the recovery the i mean the, the basic theme i think of the novel is, is surrender that one has to surrender to um find oneself that's the paradox of recovery that uh it's in our surrendering that we find our strength and so that's what i was working with with the characters you know kind of they make it if they surrender they don't make it if they they won't surrender and um you know, I didn't want to write something like a how-to book or a uh, treatise on recovery or anything. It was just recovery is more of the, the backdrop. 
and it, it provides, I guess, the themes. But uh, everybody's story, you know, everybody who gets into recovery has a story. And there are a lot of similarities, but everyone's unique. It's sort of like every happy family's alike, but every unhappy family's unhappy in its own way. I mean, every addict is unhappy in his or her own way. And so uh, there, there's so many stories to choose from or ways to tell that story. And uh, I guess that's what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. too. <clears throat> so you open with this scene of a young kid coming in uh, to the center where um, your protagonist works. And the kid's name is Oscar mm -hmm. and the protagonist is Carter. And mm -hmm. I wonder what you can tell us about their relationship because I, I thought I saw kind of the old man and the young man and he's trying to look at him and not tell him, I know where, you, where you've been and where you're going, but that's what he's thinking, right? Or what's, what's right. happening there? Right, well, I guess I'll back it up. I, um, you know, I always like those kids who are really tough kids that are, are tough to crack kids, the kind of kids that um, maybe didn't trust others or had, uh, you know, really hated authority. And, and those are the kinds of kids I like to work with myself. Uh, you know, I worked in a treatment center. I also worked at uh, Armstrong High School as a drug counselor. And so Oscar is one of those kids. He like comes in, you know, like, fuck you. <laughs> it's all, you know, he, he's got this huge wall up, right? And um, the Carter, the guy, the counselor, his challenge is to, to break through that armor and somehow uh, find the soft spots in this kid's and this kid that he can um, build upon or, or that he can reach him, make a connection, get the, you know, he's got to develop the kid's trust with him. And um, so, I mean, it's a, yeah, that's an easy setup to work with, I think, to try to, to find the tension and the drama and that and uh, ease their way through it. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I wanted to explore briefly before you read is um, your interest in use of, of, Catholicism as one lapsed Catholic uh, to another. I don't know what your status is, but um, there's a, a very interesting, funny character um, who runs this treatment center. Why did you make a, a hard drinking nun with an MBA run the treatment center? Well, isn't that a great combination? <laughs> it's just, it was fun. No, you know, I um, was raised Catholic and so Catholicism is in my bones and I, uh, even though I have since left the, the Roman Catholic Church, um, you know, I think you can take the kid out of the Catholic but you, uh, church, but you can't take the church out of, or the Catholicism out of the kid. So that remains a part of me and my psyche and, and you know, form me, shape me, influence me. I'm sure it still uh, it has a big um, uh, influence on my worldview. So uh, you know, I, I, it's funny, my, one of my mentors was J.F. Powers at St. John's University, where I did my undergraduate, and um, he was famous for writing about priests, and so I figured he'd already done that, so maybe the nuns was territory I explore, um, and I think, you know, trying to, to make this woman uh, human and uh, help, when I was growing up, you know, it was all about the the habit and uh, we couldn't really see the person for the habit and uh, I wanted to make this woman human this this nun human and see her failings and her vulnerabilities and also you know this toughness and this uh, um, side of her that wanted to that that, that was good at running a business actually uh, now that I you mention it or I mention it uh, JF Powers in um, Mort Durban his priest protagonist uh, really just wanted to be a businessman and he was better at being a businessman than a priest, I think, or he, his business sense was stronger than his pastoral sense. Um, so maybe that's uh, subconscious as cheating and, and stealing from him. Great. Well, um, why don't you do some reading for us? What do you got? All right. Well, since you brought up sister uh, Mary Xavier, the hard drinking nun with an MBA, uh, maybe it would be good to read the section where she is introduced to the reader and um, <clears throat> Carter's interaction. So to set this up, this is the beginning of chapter three, and Carter has just gone to bed, and he hears the sounds of um, this couple upstairs. They kind of go through a regular routine of uh, 
fighting and shouts, and then he hears these thumps, and then they uh, he hears their bed squeaking as they uh, make up. Um, so that's how we end chapter two, and here's the beginning of chapter three. After the noises upstairs had finally faded out, or Carter had become accustomed to the sound, the way people who live near tracks no longer hear the trains passing, he had fallen asleep. The phone woke him, Sister Mary Xavier. The previous morning, she had summoned Carter to her office with a blue post-it note on his door, see me. His first fear was that he had screwed up somehow. It was entirely possible that Sister X had received a complaint from an insurance company about his delinquent chart entries, though in the past she had praised his ability to stay a step ahead of the auditors. He had knocked reluctantly at her office. The door was imposing. A sl large slab of carved walnut that depicted scenes from the life of the Virgin, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, and so on. The door had once adorned the chapel sacristy of a convent in Italy. Sister Xavier had bought it at an auction. While Carter waited, he studied the carved figures of Mary and Jesus at the wedding at Cana. He heard no reply. Perhaps she had not heard his knock. He rapped on the door again, louder. From within came the hiss of an aerosol can, the slam of a desk drawer, then Sister Xavier's sharp command, entrez. The interior of her corner office matched the splendor of its entrance. Oil paintings on from the Walker Art Center lined two walls of cherry wainscoting. Floor to ceiling windows on the other two walls filled her office with views of the river and the university. She sat, or rather reigned, behind an enormous oak desk framed by a high-backed leather chair. Carter, good morning. Coffee? Help yourself. Why not? Thank you. Carter pulled himself a cup from her antique brass espresso machine. <clears throat> by the way, <clears throat> sorry, if anyone saw the article about Dudley Riggs in the paper and that big espresso machine that he had, that's the one I had in mind for this. That was my model for this. I'd seen that before. Anyway, Carter pulled himself a cup from her antique brass <clears throat> Sorry, Carter pulled himself a cup from her antique brass espresso machine. He spied the ashtray tucked away on a lower shelf of her bookcase. The hairspray that hung in the air stung his eyes. Carter, she began before he had settled into the leather armchair opposite her. As you know, Six West has struggled this past fiscal, this past fiscal year. He pressed her, she pressed her palm toward him. I know you don't like those terms, but we must discuss business. My job is to make this unit profitable so you can keep yours. My work is helping kids. It's not a business, he wanted to say, but he knew better than to talk back to Sister X. With insurance companies becoming more selective and paying for residential treatment and the HMOs refusing altogether, we have to ask, who will pay? Private parties can't, too expensive. Charity beds are out. The hospital will give us no more for the balance of the year. So, who will pay? Carter shrugged, uncertain of what she wanted from him. I've been asking myself that question the past several months. Finally, I believe I have found the answer. She leaned back against her leather chair and smiled for the first time since Carter had entered her office. Still thinking he might be in trouble without knowing it, he missed his cue. When Sister Xavier smiled, you wouldn't call her pretty, but she had presence. She wore a tailored power suit, reminiscent of earlier years when she had studied in Paris and developed her legendary expensive tastes. Thursday morning's navy blue suit shunned the contemporary shoulder pad fad, and probably rightly so. Her broad shoulders already made her authentically opposing, imposing. Her frame was large, yet not overweight. Her face plain, yet dignified. Whatever she lacked in physical handsomeness, however, she made up for with her powerful eyes, dark blue beams that gripped you in their gaze and would not let you go until they had finished their business with you. When she had taken over as executive director of Six West two years ago, her first project had been the renovation of her office, once the staff conference room. When the hospital administration had challenged her proposal, she had stared them down with those powerful blue beams and said simply, if you want me to transform this unit into a profitable business, you'll have to trust my decisions. Either you're with me or you're in the way. The other nuns of her order, 
the Sisters of Humility, stood by quietly, watching her with expectant pride. The only nun of the order with an MBA, Sister Mary Xavier's vocation was business. Five years earlier, she had taken over the order's sagging nursing home and miraculously turned it into a profitable venture for the nuns, primarily through fundraisers that preyed upon local parishioners' sympathetic generosity. Word was that, with the Mother Superior getting on in years, the order's 32-year-old wunderkind was being groomed to take over. In spite of Sister Xavier's contemporary fashion, she was one of the few remaining nuns who still wore a headpiece. Though not the wimple of medieval days, she wore one of 70s vintage, with the cardboard frame atop the head and the trailing cloth that fell over her shoulders. Tipped back slightly on her forehead, it crowned a set of carefully coiffed blonde curls. Her stately bearing and corporate decor demanded the respect to an executive, yet Carter could not help but approach Sister X with the reverence shown a nun. And then Carter goes into a reverie about uh, when he was a child and his mother introduced him to nuns and told them how special they were, uh, like brides of Christ. And uh, so he's, he's thinking of that. And uh, Sister Xavier declares triumphantly, the county. The county? Carter repeated, shaken from his reverie. The county will pay for treatment where insurance companies and HMOs won't. I've known that for weeks. But it wasn't until yesterday that I was able to convince an old classmate of mine down in juvenile how the county would benefit. This time, Carter caught his cue. How's that? She smiled, pleased. Juveniles who successfully complete treatment spend less time in the courts, less time in corrections. The county spends less on them. Why not make an initial investment in a juvenile to save money in the long run? They'll go along with it? He was skeptical. It wasn't clear to him how he fit in her plan. That's where our jobs overlap, she said in a conspiratorial tone, seeming to read the question in his mind. Barnes, my old high school classmate from Holy Angels, still a dutiful Catholic, has finally agreed to send over a test case. He says, this is a tough kid, doesn't think he'll make it. I want you to see that he does. Carter blanched. You can't force a kid to recover. At best, a third of the kids who complete treatment stay straight. Another third eventually make it. The rest don't. Carter's role was simply to show the way. It was up to them, not him, to surrender and accept help. Ultimately, it was up to the grace of their higher power. When a kid did make it, Carter saw it as a miracle. Sister X was commissioning him to guarantee a miracle. He could not explain this to her. He could not even protest. I'll do my best. That's not good enough. She gripped him with her navy blue eyes and said in a tone that made him believe more than his job depended on it, see that he makes it. Perhaps she read the apprehension in his expression because her tone softened. I'm asking you to do this because the kids look up to you. They respect you for knowing that it's for knowing what it's like having been there yourself. Yet, he thought, sometimes they push me away for the same reason. They don't want to identify with me as a recovering addict. One more thing. Others aren't to know about this arrangement with the county. I want to see that it works first. So this is entre nous. Understood? He nodded in mute agreement. She had secured him as her accomplice. Then that night, after the couple upstairs had worn themselves out and he had finally fallen asleep, she had awakened him with her phone call. Carter? Hmm. This is Sister Savior. Yeah? What time is it? Huh? We were asleep. This is Sister Savior. I know. See that he makes it. Sister? See that he makes it, Carter? Yes, Sister. I knew you would. And that ends Chapter 3. So Bravo. that's how we <laughs> thank you. That's how we meet Sister. Oh, you moved. Now you're over here. Um, anyway, that's how we meet Sister Xavier and uh, the the deal she strikes with him. I realized who she reminds me of. I'm a product of South Minneapolis uh, Catholic Middle School. And there was a Sister Kathleen who ran that place with an iron fist. And when I when I read this chapter. 
I just immediately was back there. And, and I, I think your image of that ornate wooden door is very right on, spot on to the, the whole, all those little touches. I feel, I feel quite afraid in her office. <laughs> thanks, so does Carter. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for indulging me that. Um, I read this book, which I really liked, uh, Mal, let's see, Mal Christ by uh, Paul John Scott. And um, let, can we segue into that? Talk about that for a while? Sure. All right, that's why we're here, right? So, that's why I'm um, here. I mean, there's so much to admire in this book, I think, uh, from the research he did to, on uh, Big Pharma and how that works, to the characters, um, there's the mysterious, sexy whistleblower. There's the down on his luck uh, journalist. There's the nefarious doctor, uh, psychiatrist, um, and on and on. So um, anyway, uh, I, I enjoyed the read. I, I you know just was gripped by the story. I really like your writing too. I mean, I've always admired your writing, uh, you know, the magazine world, but especially with the uh, this um, the novel. I think you're you're in great territory here. Um, writing fiction um, with the dialogue and, and the uh, uh, description and all that. So um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because it's it's so, I mean, you, you really go deep into big pharma and how it is uh, corrupt and in various ways uh, you detail that. And I'm just, I'm curious to know how much research you had to do to be able to pull that off and write so convincingly. I mean, cause you just, you bring us into this world and I'm willing to go there with you and uh, just, you know, take it, buy it, uh, what you're telling me about this, because it seems so real and convincing. So can you tell us a bit about the research you did? Yeah, sure. First of all, it occurred to me that uh, we both have Catholic books because my title oh, is sure, yeah. a play yeah. on Eucharist, but it's Malchorist. Yeah. So it, it's the yeah. bad sacrament and um, it's a made up word. And that's probably why it resonated with me, because like you say, you never you never shake off if you are raised Catholic. Um, and my publisher is is from uh, Ireland. So he I think he talks like this and thinks like this, too. So he loved it. But the book uh, sprung from probably three to four years of reporting uh, for magazines and then doing some newspaper writing about all sorts of uh, topics related to clinical trials of drugs and particularly psychotropic drugs. And um, uh, just sort of this period of, of discovery and being gobsmacked by a lot of the, a lot of the uh, shenanigans that go on in clinical trials. And I just started to feel like it's so boring to try to write about this in a in a way that's very um kind of finger wagging i actually wanted to to sort of funnel it all through a human story because i think the things that make these drugs really kind of strange are the the human factors involved in their genesis right these trials mm -hmm. look like they're these perfect scientific undertakings. And of course there's human beings running them and they have their own human being kind of agendas. So that's the long and short of it, of how I kind of came to it. But the one thing I was, I was happy with recently is that, so this is a book about medical ghostwriting, which is an actual trade that nobody really knows about. And it's people who are paid to um, write clinical trial studies that go in journals and then these journals go around the country and the doctors read them and they have the names of all the authors on them and it's um the principal investigators uh if it's industry run trial quite often those investigators didn't actually write out the trial of course uh they hired someone who's a really smooth writer and as a writer when i heard about this trade i thought well these these would be really cool people to run a story through because I relate to writers and, um, 
And so I thought, I want to think about what that person experienced, but it was really all just conjecture. And so I was tickled recently because I got a review on a, on a website by probably the preeminent expert on medical ghostwriting in the country. And he, he thought it all seemed spot on, but then <laughs> I was on my Amazon page and an actual medical ghostwriter was on there. And so I was a little like quaking, like, uh Oh, she's going to find out I got it all wrong. And she goes, actually, he got all that right. <laughs> so it wasn't as complicated as I thought. That's, that was exciting. So. Well, I also think it's a testament to your research and um, how you were able to put that together. And, you know, you imagine the world with a certain realism that others, uh, those in it, identified with and uh, validated for you. So, um, yeah, bravo. Um, but part of that's part of what made it so fascinating to me, too, is like all this stuff going on behind the scenes that you show us in Big Pharma. And, uh, you know, here it's a testament that it's it's accurate. Um, OK, so another uh, question I had for you. I mean, there are times I laughed out loud. I mean, I love that the writer's dog is named Lee Majors <laughs> and um, just other little bits along the way. Um, there's a scene with Dr. Elton in the cafeteria where he's just so despicable. <laughs> he's just it's just hilarious. Um, I mean, sort of like George Costanza on steroids. Um, uh, an arrogant, educated, or intellectual George Costanza. Anyway, um, there are obviously times you're having fun with the writing and the, and the characters and the scenes and the dialogue. Can you tell me about some of the times that you really, uh, or scenes you really enjoyed with this? Uh-oh, I think we may have, you, you um, just disappeared for a moment. So we'll leave that question hanging for Paul while we wait for his return. I trust he will return. Um, if not, I can read you a passage um, from the book. But no, I got to tell you, um, and maybe while Paul's not here, I really, really like this book, and I really admire Paul's writing. <clears throat> so I encourage you to, to buy it, read it, and um, tell all your friends about it. Oh, there's Anne. Hi. <laughs> while we Hi. wait for Paul to return, um, John, I just want to thank you for your reading earlier. And I did uh, want to mention to anyone watching that if they want to buy A Clean Heart, which is your book that they just heard from a little while ago, um, you are actually coming into the store tomorrow to sign yeah. the books. Um, so uh, if you order it today, you can have your book personalized by the author, John. And uh, I'll start them out I'll to you on tomorrow and be glad. Glad to personalize them. So, uh, you know, I'll sign them for whatever name appears on the credit card. Um, but if you want them, you know, personalized to someone else, give them as a gift, whatever. Just uh, yeah, shoot us an email after you put your order in. And uh, yeah, yeah, and we'll send those out as soon as they're yeah. ready. So, right. just wanted so to tell you that. And it looks like Paul is back. Sorry All about right. that. Oh, there he is. Hey, All I right. thought maybe I scared you off with my question <laughs> or that I offended you. But no, so I was asking you about, can you tell us about some of the scenes that you had fun with or moments that the writing was particularly enjoyable for you? Sure. So um, the scene I wanted to write most was uh, from the vantage point of the protagonist, who's a hack a magazine journalist, and he lives above Muddy Waters, uh, the old Muddy Waters on 24th and Lindale. And this is my life uh, back in the 90s. And he, he would go down and, and do the same thing every day and hop around and try to work from coffee shops. And in any event, he bumps into an old college friend who, of course, asks him this series of questions that every magazine journalist gets asked when he bumps into a, someone he hasn't seen in a while. And it, each question, each he ends up feeling smaller and smaller. And it kind of culminates with him uh, calling up his editor and pitching a bunch of stories and, and having the editor swat them all down and and finally uh, assign him the worst story he's ever had to report. So that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> that, and, that was a great scene, by the way. And I tell you, I cringe because those questions, it's like they just draw out the insecurity and doubt. And it's like you can no longer pretend or hide. It's just, yes, I'm nothing. I'm a failure. And meanwhile, I'm not a New Yorker. Yes. I'm not in the Atlantic. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm on a website. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that was fun. <laughs> well, a any others come to mind that? Uh, oh, well, yeah. So I'll just t say two more, and then I will stop. But um, one is um, I, I I love this character who is the um, uh, he goes by America's psychiatrist, and he's sort of a TV. Um, celebrity doctor. He's got three bestsellers out and he's very um, glamorous and he, he speaks in these platitudes and um, uh, he is of course in his private life something of a, a pig <laughs> and uh, I wanted to put him in the field and and show him you know uh, when he's uh, kind of caught not knowing something you know, because he's a he's a consummate bullshitter. And so he had to travel to um, deliver a talk uh, in India and he got tripped up. That was a lot of fun. And I actually was going to read that one tonight. And then yeah. I, I you reminded me I should practice read it. And I, I read it and I was stumbling over so many of the terms that I'm, I'm going to read the part that you had uh, raised about where he is actually um, I'll set this up. He's in a. Uh, a lunch line uh, at a at a ski resort, a mountaintop um, uh, lunch place, uh, and I based it on the Twin Elks Resort in Twin Elks Lodge in Vail, Colorado. And if you've ever seen, if you've ever been up there, it's just this funny, preposterous environment where everyone's wearing all this ski gear and they're spending a fortune on their lunch and um, behaving very badly. And so to, to set up this scene, um, Dr. Elton has been doing great his whole career, but he's been utterly dependent on this ghostwriter. And um, she has bailed on him. She's gonna blow the whistle on some things. And, um, and there's this journalist who kind of made a fool of him on a, on a show that was originally based on Charlie Rhodes. And then I had to change it because Charlie Rose became like <laughs> persona non grata in the middle of my book. Um, but um, so, yes. So now he's he's gone on TV the night before and he's starting to um, go rogue and make really bad decisions in real time. And he made a game time decision to deny that he had a ghostwriter. And so now he's off at a big academic talk uh, on a ski in a ski hill. Mm -hmm. And um, he's trying to get some lunch and his boss at the drug company has called him up to chew him out about what he did on TV last night. So all right. okay. I'll start that if that's all right. Sure, yeah. Chapter, right. 30, chapter 33. Uh, Jeremy Elton was uninspired by the offerings at his lunchtime rest stop, a luxury dining lodge 11,000 feet up the Vail Range of Colorado. For optimal comfort during his clomp through the mountain pass chow line, he'd unbuckled the latches of his $1,295 lucite and carbon ski boots. His feet were now comfortable if his mind was ill at ease. Seared tuna with wasabi and mango. Where had he seen that before? Lobster bisque with sherry. So nothing for the locavore? The non-GMO conscientious? Can I help you? Jeremy was still wearing his ski helmet and bearing the weight of this lunch. The clerk had dark eyes, thick, lustrous hair, and olive skin. Her name tag read Angelista, Buenos Aires. She could have sold skin cream at Barney's. It was Jeremy's turn to make a selection, and while a haggard lane of famished Republicans had snaked behind him, a thought from the heart had stirred within. Ignoring Angelista and the 10-person tray line, hoping just to pay, with a single pointer finger, Jeremy typed a 140 character homily to his 667,000 Twitter followers in the US, Europe, Australia, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. At Dr. Elton MD, enchanting back bowls can't compete with the sounds of woodpeckers in the Aspen. Hashtag AAPA 2011. Hashtag all altitude attitude. Hashtag always be present. Sir? Jeremy Elton looked over his tweet once again from his spellings. He changed enchanting to beguiling, then back to enchanting. He accepted the tweet button. 
The moment should have spiked his outlook, but as he knew, wherever you go, there you are, and he was here. Abandoning his position, Jeremy clomped across the slate to Santa Fe Crossing, a grilling station moving southwestern fare. He sampled the soup, derided it, derided it as briny, then signaled to Rex, Brisbane, Queensland, to ladle up a serving of high desert buffalo chili. A description noted the soup would require $14.95 a cup, $25.75 a bowl from his Crone McGill emerald card. Inspired, Jeremy instructed Rex to load up his bowl with shredded manchego and ancho lime sour cream, which he had duly pronounced crema. Pleasure, sir, Rex chimed, building the serving with care before wiping all stray droplets and finishing the presentation with a sprig of cilantro. Taking it all in, Jeremy winced. Something wasn't right. Holding the carefully constructed meal with palpable grief, America's psychiatrist had no choice but to abandon the food there on the counter. The chili looked fine, it just wasn't a chili day, and he could not have known that until he held it in his hands. Always be present, Jeremy reminded himself, feeling only compassion for Rex and more importantly, for Jeremy Elton. Yesterday, he'd been called upon once again to derail a broadcast interview on Full Aperture with Harrison Reed, a thoroughly unpleasant task involving the despicable journalist who had lured Patel out into the open. He had three talks to give, the snow in the back bowls was icy, and he was barely being paid. Compounding his burdens, Jeremy would be working with slides prepared by Patel, meaning any questions addressing data were now on him. Clumping back to the sushi station, Jeremy settled on the sustainable harvest rainbow rolls, adding a bowl of Tom Kagai and an overpriced bottle of San Pellegrino to his rapidly destabilizing tray. Waiting to pay, he grabbed a pair of cookies from a basket stationed at the checkout. $77.97 with tax. This one had a name tag that read Catherine, Adelaide, SA. Jeremy handed over his card as his phone began vibrating. The ID said MSG. Jeremy took the call, smiling warmly at Catherine's author of a slip for him to sign, but making no move to receive it. The line could wait. They would get to tell their friends, you'll never, never believe who we saw while waiting to buy lunch. Yes, Jeremy, it's Mitch. The skiing is good, I hope. It's a fine meeting, Jeremy replied, but the snow is rutted on the front side and the village is overrun with families. Mitch met the comment with silence. All these coastal fops were partial to icy and uncivil Vermont. What can I do for you, Jeremy said as he signed for the overpriced tray, then began his clomp into a dining room with a cathedral ceiling and an enormous boulder fireplace. What was that last night? Mitch was peeved, as Jeremy had guessed he would be. Well, that was a TV interview, of course, Jeremy replied. He was now wandering the hall as he talked, this Cirque du Soleil of sushi and Thai in both hands. He had slipped a cell into a strap position across his chest. The accessory transmitted their battle onto a $400 headset he'd fitted inside a $900 helmet. He'd learned to provide psychiatric sessions during blue runs, but wasn't ready to address Oedipal conflicts while navigating mobiles. The black runs tended to require his full attention. Jeremy, you made a decision decision without authorization to deny the existence of your personal ghostwriter, someone we have employed for decades and who has been credited in hundreds of papers. You do realize she has been at your side at dozens of academic meetings. Fucking Mitch, such a weak man. Jeremy shook his head at the loss, his time in the service of these people. He knew what this was about, payback for his doubts about biopherics. Patel played a small role, Jeremy replied. She's now in the past. The reporter is a nothing and a nobody. This story is over. The room was noisy. Jeremy was yelling in the translucent air of Colorado. He had returned to the checkout line. Sheila! Catherine from Adelaide looked up at him. This cookie has three M&Ms. Jeremy had taken note of the low candy count and become enraged. He tossed a snack in her cash drawer, breaking pieces over the slots for fives and tens. I'm trying the peanut butter now, he said, then picked up a replacement cookie and clomped away. Yeah, let's hope she's a nobody and a nothing, replied Mitch, who, if he had heard the fracas, was not letting on. I fail to see why you boxed us in on live TV. Now we have to roll back her digital footprint, an unfathomably expensive errand. 
given her thousands of credits scattered across the internet. Security will have to locate her physical person, then financially or otherwise persuade her to become invisible. Well, I hardly think it was helping to leave your ghostwriter's credibility intact upon the conclusion of that interview, Jeremy said. But sure, what do I know? I'm only the author of your most important papers. Mitch remained silent. He would have needed to stifle reflux at the notion that Jeremy Elton considered himself an author in the proper sense. That's right, what do you know, said Mitch. The Esquire story would have been a small curiosity in the unending landslide of magazine pap. Now we have a bona fide media scandal on our hands. Your allegation that a reporter made up his source has a considerable half-life in the news cycle. This was an unforced error. You're better than that. Well, clearly I was on the show to discredit him, Jeremy said, staring at a condiment station. What's it matter if I did so by erasing her? I chose a permanent solution. You're welcome. Nobody recovers from that one. Well, let's hope you're right, Mitch said. This crossed the line. I won't mince words. You're officially on notice. Oh, I'm on notice, Jeremy laughed. That's rich. He made sure to hang up first. It was but a tap on a button in his chest strap although he missed the button the first time, causing audible sounds as he hung up of Mitch saying, Jeremy, the thing is this, it comes down to the room entirely full, Jeremy colonized the tile in front of the condiment station, placing his tray in front of the pumps for ketchup and mustard. Removing his ski helmet and shaking out his hair, he picked up his chopsticks and began devouring the rainbow rolls, oblivious to the arrival of families seeking access to the napkins and mayonnaise he had taken out of service. A family guy stared. The fuck are you looking at, Jeremy barked. Leaning backwards, he tilted his head to signal his relinquishing of the napkins for the father of two small tots. Sorry, Jeremy offered. There's nowhere to take your lunch in this place. That's that. Fantastic. Uh, that's fantastic, Paul. Uh, I like Jeremy. people who are, who are out of control. <laughs> Oh man, the sad thing is, you know, we've all met a Jeremy, right? Who's so self-absorbed and so uh, stepping on everybody and thinks he's so wonderful. You know, like the people in line, you know, he's giving them a great story that they're going to be able to tell their friends that they got held up by America's psychiatrist or when he's um, feeling compassion for Rex because he turns down the bowl of chili he's prepared. That's rich. That's a great uh, scene. Uh, a lot of food waste up on those hills. So, right. And uh, I could relate to those prices where you think, what the hell? You know, do they have any idea what they're charging in the real world for this stuff? It's like, uh, I, I actually had a uh, copy editor up in Canada who, who wanted me to take the prices out because in Canadian money, it didn't look that strange. <laughs> well, maybe you just have to adjust uh, and do it in Canadian dollars. Um, yeah. No, that's yeah. Great. So, hey, maybe we should just um, ask each other a few questions back and forth. Um, you know, like one that I'll throw you and, and but maybe we can both talk about is what's it like to make the jump from writing for magazines, you know, the journalism to making stuff up and writing fiction? You know, I, I just, I found it to be um, such a, a wonderful uh, exit um, valve. The last, this took me eight years um, and it was, always on the side, but there were, my wife uh, was a saint and there were weekends where I would go somewhere and um, I could just work on it for eight hours. And um, I just found it to be so <laughs> pleasurable because, you know, I don't know about you, I like to make myself laugh and entertain myself. And I think the hard part I found was, was marching people through a plot that had to always keep the conflict going. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very unusual skill set, you know, and you realize very quickly, if there's no conflict, there's no novel, you know? Um, right. right. What, what about you? What did you, uh, how did you find it? Well, I, I mean, I found it very enjoyable in many aspects. Um, the, you know, what, what's easy or, about uh, journalism or nonfiction books, as I found it, is you've got all the material there. And so, you know, it's all, all the stuff is there. You just have to shape it. So it's like the, the lump of clay is on the wheel. You're just shaping the story. 
with the with fiction, the hard difficulty for me is like I have to create the clay, to, you know, to get the story going. But the fun thing is that the liberties, right, and the freedom of where I can go with that and what I can do and um, making up stuff. And, and so it's like when you, you talk about those eight hours, when those eight hours are, or when the writing's going well, those eight hours go quickly. When it's not going well and I'm stumped, that's when it's like, oh, I wish I just had some facts here that I could mm -hmm. give. Right. Um, the, the other thing I find too is that um, with the, with um, fiction, it's, you know, I can get immersed in this world of make believe and it's just, it's sort of like going into the zone. And this happens, I guess, sometimes with nonfiction, but more so with, with fiction. It's like being in that dream state where, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's intoxicating, right? I mean, if you, you, I'm sure you've had that experience where you're just, the words are going and the story's going and you're just kind of along for the ride. Yeah. Although I, I know I had, I don't want, I mean, I know I had my moment in the valley of the shadow of death or whatever the phrase is. I think it happens like a third of the way through or half of the way. It's before the halfway point where you might have that first 70 pages um, that were kind of written out of adrenaline. And then, and then you suddenly feel the enormousness of what you set out to do and you don't want the time to be wasted, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah tons of the rewriting too is was just enormous i mean you have to be willing to write such garbage and then um look at it and i put this away for a year i got i had a reader read it and he, he just ripped it to pieces and i <laughs> broke my heart but he was right and the things he said were right and i i took it out after a year and i could see things differently you know but yeah well, we've, we've talked about this too, uh, off air, about the revising and how important that is. And, and uh, I know for me, it was really painful to cut some sections that I really liked. Um, like I opened it originally with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden smoking a joint instead of eating an apple. <laughs> I loved that scene. You know, I kept saying, Eureka. But, you know, it just didn't work with the novel. So I had to take it out. Or there's scenes where I, I, I mean, I went uh, first person. You know, I changed all the first person, then I went back to third person. And because, you know, I thought first person would be more immediate or personal or something, but I don't think I had the voice to carry it up, pull it off. And so I had to go back. And um, that, I guess that's the part people don't see, right? Where, uh, it, sound, it sounds fun and, and a lot, some, a lot yeah, of it is, but it's, that really makes it what it is. No, I mean, I, I cut out, um, I must have cut out 80 to 100 pages. And you know how that is. It's, you, you love that stuff. And there, I had an opening I just I loved, and I <laughs> polishing the apple and polishing the apple, and then I had to throw it in the garbage, you know. Yeah. And um, that's that's the funny part. Um, you just you have to be really merciless and think about the reader the whole time, you know. So yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I really as a reader. Um, think that i mean i gotta say i think you made the right decisions in this um because the final product comes off really it well the way it, <laughs> no but the way it, the way it comes off the um like i didn't read it and think oh there's something missing or that uh you know i think he should have done this i just i i was swept away by the story and you know even as you're reading that uh, section about elton i was catching details that i really hadn't noticed as much the first time and um it was I just, I felt like you got it right with uh, the decisions you were making with the revision. Oh, good. Well, again, I'll just say I was um, really shaken up by the end of your book and I wasn't expecting it. And it's a very small scene. And it, I, I just felt like, my, I felt like my heart grew three sizes, you know, and I'm not bullshitting you. I mean, just this, uh, the way that you help the reader understand the pain of uh, childhood in um, alcoholic family systems. Um, some of the images and stories, just it, bravo. I mean, to, to sneak up on that was really, really good work. <laughs> well, thank you. And I should make the disclaimer that, um, yes, I went through treatment uh, when I was young and Carter uh, went through treatment when he was young. And yes, I worked in treatment centers and Carter worked in treatment centers. But 
Carter's mom is an alcoholic, and my mom wants you to know she's not an alcoholic. Got you. <laughs> yeah. And with I know. I know I noticed we have the Virgin looking over us here too. I love these. I love icons, and so. No, <laughs> I thought that be because, because I um I have an editor in in this book um who's an idiot, uh, and um uh, I just sent the book to my old editor, yeah. and I was like telling him, "It's not you." <laughs> it's not you. And so, have you heard from you? Have you what's that? You haven't. Heard have you heard back from him yet or not? No, I have not. And so, uh, but my wife is is very um, certain that it's not because he's upset. He's just a slow reader. So, yes, yes, I'm I'm sure that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is, too, it's like uh, some people won't see themselves. You know, like they're oblique, or some will see themselves and be flattered, even if it's unflattering. You know, I, I've actually had that experience in uh, journalism where I'll write about someone and they might might be rather unflattering, but they didn't go. Oh, that was good. He mentioned my name. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, um, you know, the thing is you can't, you can't tell how someone else reads anything, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's true. Um, so should we open it up, uh, Annie, if you're there, uh, are there any questions from out in uh, the cyber world that, uh, we should oh. answer or anything we didn't cover you'd like to hear about? Yeah, so I don't see any questions here, but I would like to know, um, okay. well, one of my questions, you actually asked each other of what was the transition like from nonfiction into fiction. Um, I think that's always an interesting transition working in different uh, mediums and genre, but uh, the classic end of a reading question is, what's What are you next? working on now? What are you working on? <laughs> <laughs> you first, John. Uh, I've been busy writing reviews on Amazon for my book on <laughs> under pseudonym. Yeah, a lot of that. How do you keep changing your name? Um, I do. Uh, I just go through the phone book. Remember that Saturday Night Live skit where Richard Nixon's writing to repeal the Twenty uh, Fifth Amendment? You know the limit, the term limits. I just go through the phone book and pick me. No, um, I guess seriously, I um. Just did a really long piece about a 10,000 word piece on Lois Reese and Paul. I'm sorry, I meant to send you the link. It just went live yesterday. I started um, Lois reading Reese. the scripting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this, she's this woman uh, from Blooming Prairie who killed her husband and then uh, killed a woman in Florida who looked like her, stole her identity, wound up in Texas, got uh, caught two years ago. And it's a very sad story about mental illness and gambling addiction. And, um, but it's also, like this woman is so unusual uh, for who she is. And, and that, that fascinated me. So anyway, I did, that just came out in the Atavist yesterday. Okay. And um, I just did a, finished an article I turned in about the encampments here in Minneapolis, um, you know, puts homelessness in our face and all those issues and the racial and economic injustice endemic in our society. So um, that'll come out in Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine in November. Oh, um, so those are a couple of my projects. Yeah, that's great. Paul? What about you, Paul? Uh, I, too, am writing reviews of my book on Amazon, but I go through Russian servers. I have a big <laughs> network. <laughs> and so do they just generate them automatically for you? You don't have to actually write them? Yes. <laughs> robots do it? <laughs> no. Um, no, I swore after this I would not try this again for a while, but, of course, I just... I just came across a story recently and I said to my wife, I go, I think this is, I think this is a novel. It's, a, um, yeah, yeah. And it's exciting, but it's also kind of sobering because you know what's involved and hopefully it wouldn't take eight years again, but I write for a newspaper chain uh, uh, called forum news service, which is 30 newspapers around the state. I'm the health guy. So they keep me very busy with COVID, especially right now. Yeah. Um, but um, I would like to take this, um, I'd like to explore a small town newspaper. I think the, the last book, this book explored um, men's magazine hack writing, which was mm -hmm. a lot of fun because I, I toiled in that world for a long time. But um, I just think there's a, a lot of neat stuff in, in small town papers. So I got an idea, but I, I won't bore you with it just yet. 
well, I think, yeah, I think ideas are going to come to you now that you've done one. I think things are going to keep coming to you because you're a writer. Um, okay, well, we have a comment here. Thanks for a nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, how about uh, both of you tell us where we can find you, um, your websites, your social media, um, and uh, I will remind people that I've already put links to A Clean Heart and Malcharist on the Majors in Quinn website where you can go check that out and uh, we are open for limited browsing you can come in the store and purchase it or you can use the website and we do have shipping or store pickup so we would uh, love to see you but you can also definitely shop from your homes and so now john and paul tell us where we can find you well my website is really hard to remember it's it's my name <laughs> pauljohnscott.com so that would that would get any, you could send email or find the book that way. Uh, we have a link up to Majors and Quinn right at the top. So nice. you go ahead, John. Right. Mine is also very uh, tricky, johnrosengren.net. But here's the thing, it's it's .net. If you go to .com, you'll find a realtor in Illinois. So it's johnrosengren.net, N-E-T. <laughs> nice. think, think hockey. Yeah. .net. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. This has been lovely. Um, and I hope that we get to speak again on your future projects and we'll be on the lookout for those uh, uh, newspaper and magazine projects that you were speaking of. So have a great evening. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Annie. Well, thanks, thanks for having us, Annie. This was a lot of fun. Paul, good